Welcome to this short presentation on interoception and the NEST project. What we're going to look at is briefly what interoception is again, which hopefully will clarify any questions, and it's linked to alexithymia and what that is, how we can teach it, and what the NEST project is meant to be, and why should you bother being involved. So we now know that there are eight sensory modalities. So everyone will have known the five, um, smell, taste, hearing, touch and sight. And those people who've done a lot of autism work will know about vestibular and proprioception, which are both around um, the body. And the eighth one is interoception, which is your awareness of your internal body states. So that's your physical body states as well as your emotional body states. And interoceptive awareness is broadly defined as that conscious perception of your body states. So your heartbeat and your breathing are two internal body cues. All of our internal physical body cues are related to our emotional internal states. And these are known to be seriously affected in children on the autism spectrum, but we also know that they're affected in kids with trauma, kids um, with neglect, all kinds of things. And it's about 10% of the population that have really big difficulties with this as adults. So you assume that clearly we're missing something out along the way. The implication of the current research is that a lack of interoception is one of the core factors in shutdowns and meltdowns and challenging behaviour. And if you think about it, it's kind of like if you don't know what you feel like, you can't change how you feel. So then that instinct kicks in, that fight or flight instinct. The theory is if we get the inside right, we get to know our inside, we can connect with the outside appropriately. Self-regulation is something I hear a lot about. Mm -hmm. And self-regulation is really a misnomer in primary schools and even secondary schools. It's regulation of the child with adult support. And if they have no interoception, they really cannot self-regulate. So if you look at interoception as the awareness of internal body states, physical, and of feelings, you can see how those are required in order to be able to self-regulate. The other thing you also need is an awareness of how the external stimuli affect your internal body states. So for example, those kids that get hangry, they need to know that when they're hungry, they get angry. Mm -hmm. If they don't know that, they can't do anything about it. And if you don't know that, you can't do anything about it. So all of those are required for self-regulation. So interoception forms two parts of the three that are required. This is a really bad slide, but it's really important because interoception links to all the research on emotion, social and emotional skills, but also about metacognition. So you've just been doing around curriculum. Metacognition is, is the knowledge of knowing and learning. So if we can link them all together, we can see why they have a place in schools. <coughs> so if you're talking about knowledge that mental states exist being the lowest level of metacognition, that means we cannot get any further up the chart of knowing and knowledge until we have a knowledge that mental states exist, which we link to noticing internal body states. So it's not any good having an intellectual idea that body states exist. If you go, oh, yeah, people get angry, but I've got no idea what that means, it's not very useful. So actually being able to notice your own anger is important. Knowing distinct mental processes. And can you see how that really links to the, the interoception as well? Because you've got to be able to recognise and name your internal body states. So they all link together and it links with the emotional, cognitive and behavioural skills. The, the goal of it all is that you can manage the response of your internal body states to external stimuli, which in metacognition terms is being able to self-assess your cognitive processes and therefore direct your personal behaviour. <coughs> and yes, that was in terms of learning, but actually you have to learn to know yourself in order to be able to learn effectively elsewhere. Alexithymia is really strongly linked to interoception. Alexithymia is an inability to recognise and describe your own emotions. So you can see 
how interoception is directly linked to this. There's been a lot of research that suggests people have alexithymia because of a lack of interoception, but really we don't know and it's not really relevant. We know that people without interoception often have alexithymia, but if we can teach them interoception, then hopefully that will decrease. Um, I like Spock, he's a very good example of alexithymia. About 50% of kids on the spectrum and adults on the spectrum have alexithymia, but about 10% is the general population. So again, that links directly to the interoception. There are other ways of managing alexithymia. They did some great research in the US. This is a, an actual advert from great Google. Um, there was a spray and they trialled spraying the oxytocin um, up your nose and it did help some kids and adults in the autism spectrum to compensate for their natural alexithymia but it did not work for everyone which implies that it is not actually a chemical imbalance causing the alexithymia, it's probably a lack of interoception. The other idea is, well, we can treat alexithymia by just going, it doesn't matter that you can't recognise your own emotions, you have to respond to everybody else's appropriately. And we can do that with social skills. So super skills is the only social skills programme that I've ever found that works. And um, McLaren did some research in 2014, reviewed 91 social skills programmes and found that none of them were effective. So she found key aspects that were effective and talked about how to put one together, but basically they're not effective because the kids don't have those base skills. They don't recognise their own emotions and therefore they can't respond properly to the emotions of others. So this is what we're doing here, trialling, specifically teaching interoception. This was done in the USA and the information that came out this year that it was really effective at helping with self-regulation. This was with adults. Um, there was some really good research around war veterans um, from Afghanistan and the Iraq. And they went through this interoception program and they were far more able to self-regulate. So these were basically soldiers with PTSD, serious PTSD. And they were able to manage themselves afterwards. So, I figure if it works for them, it's got to work for kids. But you need to know where the kids are at first. So some of you may or may not have seen the tracking sheets. This is the first half of the tracking sheet. And I just want you to think about if you can do everything on this sheet. Because statistically speaking, there should be one person apart from myself in here that can't do everything on here. So and you've got to think about the implications of, for example, not knowing when you're thirsty. Mm. You don't know mm. when you're thirsty, what happens? You don't drink. What happens when you don't drink? You get dehydrated. What else? Headaches. Can you learn effectively when you're dehydrated and have a headache? No. So some of these have implications for learning that well, sort of, it's a bit mind-blowing when you think, wow, they're just not learning because they didn't drink, because they didn't know to drink. Wow, that's so easy to solve. Things like not knowing when to go to the toilet, that's a really big problem for most kids when they start a reception. They get too engrossed. They don't know. They have accidents. However, you'll get some 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 year olds that still don't know when they need to go to the toilet until it's almost too late. And they're the ones that just get out and run. So that's again a lack of interoception. They're not aware of those physical body cues. So this is the second page of it. Um, and this is getting a little bit more in detail. So know when I'm starting to get angry. Rather than I know when I am angry, I know when I'm starting to get angry. Because know when you're angry, it's a bit late. We're already really hyped up and we might not be able to calm down as easily. But if it's, you know when you're starting to get angry, that's when you can take the time and breathe or do whatever your, your strategy is. So if we go back, it says date when achieved. So for kids that struggle with this, 
This would be something you do with them. Internal signals that tell me. Because just because they can intellectually say doesn't mean they're always going to recognise it. They may need that prompt. Oh, look at my sheet. Okay, it says, when I feel tight across the bottom of my stomach, that means I need to go to the toilet. Okay. So then they do sit-ups in gym and they think they need to go to the toilet. So then you need to refine that as well going forward. How I can respond to this in a helpful way. This is the most important part of this. That would be, okay, I get a headache when I'm thirsty. What do I do about it? And that's your strategies for helping them self-regulate. So what could you do about that? That's a really easy one. Drink some water. We're going to try out one of the activities. So this is not hard. Everyone can do this. And I picked this activity because it's apparently one of the favourite activities in the nest. But we're going to do it the other way than the way that you do it. Okay, so we're going to feel our pulse. So everybody sitting down, that's okay. You need to rest your hand on your leg with your thumb up, so like that. And what you do is you just stroke down until you get to the top of your thumb where your fingers are reaching your wrist. So it's sort of like that. See, down here. Because your pulse, you're feeling that bit there. Now the reason you have to have your hand relaxed is if your hand is tense, you can't find it. But you can move it around until you can. If you can't find it, you can do your crosses pulse, which I can't do because that freaks me out knowing. So when you've found it, we're going to time it for 15 seconds. Has everybody found it? Yeah? Okay. So I'm going to say start when you start and you're going to count it for the 15 seconds. Okay, you ready? Start. Stop. Okay, can you times that by four? If you times it by four, then that should be 10 minutes. So can you write that down? Okay, because now we're going to either jump up and down or run on the spot for a minute. Okay? If you have, if you have injuries to your legs, then you can just stand up and just move. A little bit, okay? But otherwise, everybody ready? Okay? We're going to be holding it, go. Okay, you've got to run quite fast. Okay, you've got to pretend you're your kids. Running quite fast. Or jumping up and down, or both. Okay? It's a really good moving here. Okay, take your pulse again, find it, and then we're going to start again, okay? Starting now. Stop. Okay, times that by four. Okay. Whose pulse was higher before they did the jumping and running? No? Yours was. Maybe can't count. Maybe? What was it before you started? 80. And what was it afterwards? 64. You definitely counted wrong. <laughs> it's really hard to find it, so you might need to practice finding it or do the karate next time. Who noticed a big increase? Okay. And who didn't notice a very big increase? So the people over here. Turn up the stairs at home. Okay. <laughs> Why do you think your pulse increased? Because you're hurting. You're working harder. Something's blood. I think you're hurting. Yeah. Is there any other time when your pulse increases? Nervous, nervous, nervous or stressed, excited, excited, 
angry? Yes. So this activity has been really popular in the nest with checking it when they arrive and then doing it again before they leave and noticing that when you're calm, your heart rate is lower. So we have a default resting heart rate and you want kids to be within that range when they're in school because you don't want it too high when they're working because they're not going to be able to focus as much. So it's a really useful thing to do. Yeah, the karate is easier for some people. It's just when you first start to teach interoception explicitly, the rationale behind it is to develop that ability to manage yourself with support. So when you example in reception, you might need additional prompts for teaching interoception explicitly. You can have visual prompts and verbal prompts. So when you have a visual timetable, for example, you should probably have toilet prompts on there too. If you've got even one child in your class that isn't so in touch with when they need to go. Because just because you say before recess, right, everybody go to the toilet, wash their hands, have their snack and then go and play, doesn't mean that kid picks up on them and go to the toilet. They're the ones that come back 10 minutes after recess, are rushing out the room because they suddenly really need to go to the loop. So you need to be planning that. There are several ways of doing the not knowing when you're thirsty. Some schools are happy for kids to have water on their tables, and in fact some schools it's compulsory for kids to have water bottles on their tables. If that is the case, that is fantastic, and just prompt them to drink every now and then. Um, have a drink. The people that know about water being food for the brain, this is my brain food, that seems to be a really popular one with kids too. And it's true, the more we can get kids to drink water rather than fizzy, the more that they equate that with being healthy and having the good ability to learn, the better that is. Um, where you have kids that really just cannot get the hang of drinking when they're thirsty, they really like to know about the colour of urine. Mm. So the darker it is, yes. the more dehydrated you are. Mm -hmm. But families don't tell their kids this kind of thing anymore. So it's a really good skill though. All the way through their life, they're going to know, oh, I need to drink a bit more water, or I'm okay. Posters in the toilets. Posters in the toilets, yes. Yeah. yeah, it's a really good idea. Okay, so what is the NEST project? The NEST project is combining two things. So it's combining the explicit teaching of interoception designed to improve awareness of students' own emotions and therefore the ability of students to monitor and respond to their emotions with the goal of increasing engagement in learning. The other thing that we've combined is the strategies from the UK that were found to be the most effective strategies at providing inclusion effectively in schools which was a flexible withdrawal space open to all students whenever they need them. So that flexible withdrawal space is really important because we have set it up here in a particular way. It's not just a go there when you feel like it. It's a space where they redo some of that interoception one-on-one -on -one with guidance. And therefore, they might not know when they need to go to the nest. They're relying on adults to send them there. Or if their interoception is a bit better, they know when they need to go, but they may still need prompting to do some of those strategies when they get there to be really in touch with how to calm down and be ready to work. So if you're planning to send students, you need to get them before there are four or five on the incredible five-point scale. It's too late then. We need to be really aware of our kids' moods when they're not aware of them themselves and sending them with their work. Because not only do they do that interoception, they then work. And the idea is that they're not engaged with learning for a very short period of time. They get shorter and shorter and shorter. And eventually, some of the kids won't need to go to the nest. They'll know that they just need to do a breathing exercise or they just need to do a muscle 
relaxation exercise and then they can continue with their work. So it's the kids that do go, instead of not working for half an hour to three hours, they're re-engaging within five to 15 minutes, which is really, really good. And that space to engage in their work is really important that we've linked the two together. So the research shows that the most effective way of using both of these strategies is for all the students to do interoceptive activities on a regular basis. So for, this will depend on your class, whether you do it first thing in the morning or just after recess or before or just after lunch or after. Because they're only one to five minutes, depending on what you do, even if you did it three times a day, you're only taking three to 15 minutes. And that's three to 15 minutes where the kids would not have been engaged anyway. And so what you're doing is you're speeding up the re-engagement process. When a student wants to visit the nest, or you want them to, then they need to have their pass to go with their work. And the reason for this is, this is about learning that there are rules and regulations around the way that you behave and the way that you manage yourself. So, for example, as an adult, I can't just leave a meeting without saying something. It's, it's really inappropriate to just disappear. Mm -hmm. And if they go to high school and they just disappear from a classroom, they're going to be repercussions. Whereas if they know they have to have a pass to go, they know that this is a, you know, an official thing, it's set up, it, it's properly run, it's not just a free reign. When they arrive, they do some mindful body awareness, interoception activities, for as long as they need to. So for some students it might be 30 seconds, for some students it might be 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. That time period should decrease the longer the program is running. Then as soon as they are able to work, they work. So even if they choose not to go back to class after they've completed their work, there is more work there in the nest and they will be given more work to do. So they are still engaged in learning. So that will be really useful for those kids that have not previously been engaged in learning. So this is coming from students as well as academic research. So we're hoping that they will be ready to go back to class quicker and quicker and quicker. But even if they're not, they are working. So the reason why it seems to be effective is that it's not just about learning a skill for the here and now. It's not just about saying, I need a break card. It's about learning those skills about when you need a break, how to manage yourself so you don't need a break for very long. <coughs> Other trials, including the veterans one, found that aggressive incidents really decreased because the students develop an awareness of when they're getting angry instead of, oof, oh, I was angry. Mm -hmm. They realise they're getting angry and they can act on that sooner. Because they are calm more frequently, their engagement with learning has increased dramatically. Another thing that's really important for you as teachers and your other students is that disruption is minimised. Because you have less challenging behaviour in the classroom, the disruption to the other students is minimised. But equally to that student, because they are doing the work they should have been doing. And it's easy to teach the interoception and it's really easy to monitor. It's not expensive, it's free, it's not hard and you can see results fairly quickly. The other reason that it's really good that you're trialling this is because this will help to prevent emotional problems or concerns becoming mental illness where it isn't there yet. So we're not doing medication and talk therapy because that's not our job. That is not your job as educators. What you're doing is you're tackling those things like a lack of sense of belonging and a feeling of alienation because you cannot feel like you belong unless you feel connected to yourself first. So that's a really important step that you're doing. All people start off calm and relaxed. And then when there is an external stimuli, 
that says, danger, danger, you get your fight or flight response. The kids with poor interoception, they can have that far more frequently because they don't know that, for example, being hungry isn't a dangerous impulse. So they will go into that fight or flight mode inappropriately and you know that for lots of your trauma children that happens. So as you go through that over and over and over, you get heightened and more and more alert more and more of the time. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to go here and teach the skills so that they know when it is and isn't a dangerous incident. So we break that whole cycle that can lead to heightened levels of mental illness. So you're doing both of these things, teaching protective things like mindfulness and mindful body awareness and whole school strategies because it's no good just one teacher doing it. It needs to become a part of the way that you do education so that when somebody in one class is starting to get a bit heightened, they can either go to the next or if they have developed more interoception, self-awareness, they know to do those activities to calm themselves down.